Hey, my name is Matt Storr and I repair saxophones for a living and we are continuing our in-depth uh, tour of my repair shop in an Airstream trailer. Um, and we've already gone over the general stuff. We've talked about my lathe situation. Uh, we've gone over the dent workstation. And this will be probably, we'll see if I can get through all the tools. I don't know. Um, one thing to note is that in the description, there are some links to some uh, articles I've written on the open source saxophone project that describe these tools in more detail and where you can get them. Um, so if you're going to be asking those questions down in the comments, check out those articles first. And they're actually divided into like the first set of tools you should buy and then like the next big tool buy. Um, and there's also information in there on like, you know, good saxophones to learn repair on. Um, and there's some, you know, other articles about repair, but uh, for more detail on the tools, go there. But this is just sort of a tour to show you what I've got. Um, a lot of what you see here will not be in those articles because it's like, you know, you do 90% of your work with 10% of your tools, right? Um, but over time, you, you know, get more and more tools so that when those particular use cases come up, um, you know, you've got exactly what you need. So this is my main workbench. Um, the only thing that's missing right now is a, a little lathe that I use as a bench motor here. Um, that has been, so I've still got another bench motor right there. And that is the Freeze like slim one. Um, that's inside and actually I'll add a little bit onto the end of this video so you can see what that looks like. Uh, this is my like kind of main tool chest. And this, if I ever need to like, you know, go in when I, when I go inside, which I'm doing now a lot because of the pandemic working inside at my secondary workbench, because I've got young kids, uh, this is the thing that comes with me. And what's in here is uh, up top. You can see, I've got my, um, uh, tone hole files the, that says Kraus. I do have the Kraus set, but this is actually like the regular diamond grit set. Um, my Kraus set is down here. Let's see. Nope, not there. Here. That's my Kraus set of tone hole files, which I rarely use, and those are not made anymore. Um, I've got like kind of a you know quick backup of like common vintage sax parts, um, and I've also got uh, where I keep like felts and stuff in there. And let's see. We'll just go drawer by drawer. So I've got my, you know, uh, pipe cleaners and Q-tips. You can see they're the double-ended kind. Um, you can get those on Amazon. They're like gun cleaning Q-tips. Razor blades. Uh, various pliers. And I guess, let's see. I can actually go through some of these. So the ones I use like most are here. Round nose, flat, uh, parallel flat. Uh, and then two types of swedging plier. And then in here are kind of like my other ones that I use sometimes, but not all the time. I've got uh, like wire cutters. I use these mostly for the um, pipe cleaners so I can like use it over and over without, and just cut little dirty pieces off. Flat jaw, I don't use these too much, but I just like, um, this is Utica pliers. I like finding old Utica pliers on eBay and picking them up. This is another set of Utica pliers. This one's actually pretty useful. These are like, I think, gas pipe fitting, like get like lineman's pliers or something for like gas uh, ranges back in the day. And that is really helpful for extracting really stuck rods. You can grab it on the end and, and pull. Um, obviously it's gonna like kind of ruin the rod, but when they're that stuck, usually you wanna replace anyways. Parallel jaw. Um, these are kind of handy. These are for like, I use these usually for straightening out the edges of um, pad cups. Let's see here. So when pad cups are bent, um, you can grab them. It's like hard for me to do with my bro broken wrist. You can grab them in a way that you know, doesn't damage it and you can like, like pull it back into place. Spring bending pliers, really handy. Don't need them all the time, but they're really handy when you need them. Uh, these are pliers that allow you to push broken springs out of a post. 
and that is really really handy basically you press that little guy against the um, busted off piece some parallel pliers with um, serrated jaws another thing for pulling uh, stuck rods out key bending pliers another set of flat jaw parallel pliers duck bill don't use these too often, but every once in a while you've got a use case for them. Um, and spring installation pliers. And I just kind of collect pliers over time. I mean, it sort of seems like not harmful to do, um, but I probably use, like the five I showed you earlier, I probably use those the most often. Um, and that's like kind of what I have in my hand like 90% of the time um, is these here. Next, we've got, uh, these are my pad slicks, uh, neck checkers, a couple of exact size reamers, um, some inside calipers for like measuring key heights and duplicating them if I want to, and some wax for sax neck corks, felt, synthetic felt, Teflon, leather, and cork shavings which I use a lot actually at cork shavings I find I have a lot of use for regular cork and synthetic cork uh, this is kind of like a junk drawer I need to like actually do better with this um, feeler gauge steel wool brass wool um, neck cork scraper and the you know uh, bumper adjuster here is let's see yeah you can see that files of various types, uh, key bending uh, levers, key bending wedges, um, tubing of various types, and this is a like burnisher for um, getting out dents. Put this in a tone hole and you put this under and you can lift it up. Screwdrivers, hole punches, um, high quality hole punches. I highly recommend them. Um, these are from what CS Osborne, and the punches themselves are replaceable. Definitely recommend uh, the high quality ones. Uh, a scraper, um, micrometer. Wait, is that a micrometer? Or is that calipers? I always get those two mixed up when I'm thinking about it. I think too hard. And then down here, I've got like my key fitting tools. Um, pivot screw counter bore, uh, hinge tube facers. These are not made by Kraus anymore, but you can get these in other places. Lapping compound, lots of different swedging pliers, um, and then exact shape pivot reamers, um, some of which I've made, some of which are from Kraus, which again, unfortunately, are no longer made anymore. Um, and then uh, swedging collets. Also, you see there's my torch. Um, that is a air and acetylene torch, and I've got various tips over here. And then I've got a butane torch. Um, this is really handy. I like it a lot. I use the butane torch more than I used to, though, now. Gel super glue, Loctite 454, um, or now it's just called Ultra Gel Control. It's pretty great. Uh, naphtha dispenser. Um, pivot grease, my preferred type of Dremel. They don't make this anymore. That's saying that a lot. I guess it's because it's getting old. Um, I've got a couple of these, and I'll just keep fixing them until I can't do it anymore. But I really like the control this gives me when I'm using it. A um, couple of tools that you'll recognize back here. The neck cork scraper, bumper adjuster, uh, pad slick, um, pin vise. This is a... Can you get it to focus? I don't even know where I got this one, but I really like it better than most of what you can get today. Uh, this is a spring hook, and I find putting a little angle on it at the end is actually really helpful. Drumstick stub, really handy for like holding down uh, pads that are too hot. Um, various uh, tweezers. If we go up a little higher, we've got more pliers, duck bill, uh, flat, key bending, uh, spring installation, uh, like a bent tip needle nose, those like 
gas fitting pliers I really like from Utica. These are Utica 1300-6, if you ever wanted to try and get them on eBay. Spring removal pliers, these are just sort of like high torque, like basically shaved off um, needle nose they help you get like a really strong grip on like a spring stub that's broken off to get them out uh, more like flat needle nose and then like small uh, bending pliers my screwdrivers I highly recommend the highest quality screwdrivers you can find I've got a couple of Krauss handles left one Krauss blade these screwdrivers are like mythical um, they don't make them anymore but I've had this one for like 15 years and it's the tiny, tiny one and these always break. Um, but this one has not. This is a really, really great screwdriver. The other ones I use right now are from JL Smith. Um, they have a great policy, at least <laughs> I hope they still do, um, where when they break, they replace them for free. So here's some I need to return. Um, and so far they've replaced them every time. I think it's kind of crazy, especially because I work on vintage horns. So a lot of this stuff is stuck. So I feel like I probably break more screwdrivers than most people. Um, but they've done it every time, but I really like their screwdrivers as far as the ones you can buy these days. Um, Whiteout, this is for um, protecting from solder overflow. Uh, some old like silicone pad treatment, this was given to me, and I mean, you can see how full it still is. Like, I use it every once in a while, but not really. Um, some more lapping compound, this is nail polish. Um, you can use that to like, put a little dab on it and lock like the adjustment screws on a Selmer into place for the G-Sharp and Bis. And I've had this for, I don't know, 10 years, and that's how much I've used, so you really don't need much. Thin oil, penetrating oil, medium oil, flux. Um, my heavy oil is not here right now, but I usually, for almost everything, I use heavy oil. The heaviest oil I can use that doesn't slow it down. Um, ribbon solder, uh, 96.4 regular solder. A striker for my torch, rawhide hammer, uh, spring installation hammer. A uh, nice shop computer is really, really good to have. I recommend getting an old ThinkPad on eBay. Um, work surface. I use a big leather sheet. I know there's lots of different things people use. Let's see here. Tester mouthpieces. Um, the contact cement that I like. Uh, more grease, more lapping compound. This is the lapping compound I use most of the time. And let's see here. You can see down bottom there, I've got more of my um, pad slicks. And I bend them in a certain way that I find really useful. So you just get two sets of parallel pliers and then bend it, you know, hold it on each side. So you get a clean bend that doesn't like mess up the angle of the pad slick itself. So here I've got actually some like old clarinet pads, wood wedges. Um, here's some of those punches like for the replaceable. Uh, let's see, can I do it without tipping them out? Yeah, there that goes with um, my hole punches. Leftover bits from reusable resonators. Same thing. Um, some random flute tools I have, uh, washers, and I don't really use those but because I've, I've had these like forever, but they're still there. Like Mylar washers, like for spacers on like really poorly fit keys that you can't spend time fitting. And then pins for my pin vices. Um, more neck checkers, neck isolators, um, neck screw extractor. This is like a cheap specialized tool. Uh, let's see. Let's see if you can see the like end of it basically just stick it into the broken stub and you should be able to unscrew it. I don't use it much, but when I need it, I need it. Feeler gauges um, and feeler gauge material. Mouthpiece patches, um, some tiny, tiny Dremel bits. Let's see if I can get one of these out. Pardon my ashy hands. That's the one that's healing and it's like got lots of dry skin because I'm not like using it as much. And it's not getting um, like abraded off through natural activity. Uh, rubber bands, pens, uh, glue. These are the 
silicone discs I use in my Dremel. Uh, here's the Con neck tool. That is a super big help for removing the locking ring on Con saxophones that have a micro tuner neck. Uh, nothing. Tweezers, punches, uh, some reamers, like some pentagonal reamers. You don't need them often, but when you need them, you need them. They're really good for making spring holes slightly larger in posts. Um, if you you know put a spring in and it's just not strong enough, no matter how much you tension it, you ream out the hole and put it in a larger spring. Um, here are rivets and my rivet setting tool. Cork shavings, more Teflon stuff, Teflon tubing, sheet, um, some felt, synthetic felt, um, hospital art. This is like band-aids. And one thing that's super handy to have in this job is the, you know, paint your own skin on. That's super helpful. Um, various Dremel bits. I don't use most of these. Um, probably I use this little tiny, like miniature buffing wheel, the silicone discs. And every once in a great while, like I'll actually use like, you know, like something like this. But I mean, I think honestly, I've only used this on like non-saxophone things. Um, I use the tiny, tiny Dremel bits to like put a like point in um, or like to drill out the lock screws on cons. I do that quite often. Uh, reeds, um, micrometers, Dremel stuff, torch nozzles, um, small parts. So I keep my small parts from overhauls in Altoid sins, you know, like screws that you want to take out, um, the neck screw, um, you know, stuff like that, that you don't want to like have rolling around inside uh, a bin with like all the keys. Um, I've got some, you know, I've tried to use these, like this is a uh, deburring tool. I've tried to use that on the inside of tone holes that you level, but it just doesn't seem very precise to me. So I, I just kind of always do that by hand. Uh, razor blades, single edged is what I use for most things. But then sometimes you want like a really, really sharp blade. And I actually get like, you know, the double edge stuff for like shaving. And you just go like this when it's in the package. Snap, snap. And now you've got two small, super sharp single edge blades. They're not good for very long. You can only cut like, you know, like it's for shaping cork. Uh, you can only like, cut one or two pieces, but it does a great job. Um, synthetic cork and then more cork and felt. Um, and you'll also see, you know, speakers there. I really like having a nice sound system in here. Um, and these are decent. This is like the Klipsch Promedia 2.1. Highly recommend it for really cheap, like plug and play speaker system. I've got nice speakers inside that kind of spoil me. So I don't know. I don't really have room, but maybe one day I'll update this. Um, I like having good lighting. Dazor lamps, D-A-Z-O-R. You can get them on eBay. They're like vintage steel. And they just last like forever and ever and ever. Um, my leak lights. I've got two. Um, the one I use most is a custom made one that Brad Wary made for me out of Seattle. He's just like, hey, check your mail. And he sent me like this incredible leak light system. Um, it's got a plug on top. Let's see, is it going to shock me? No, the new one doesn't shock me. <laughs> um, it's got a uh, set uh, up here for like a small incandescent light I don't have plugged in right now. And I think this is going to have like... Yeah, so that side does this one. This side does this one. And that's like the starter for if I want to do a fluorescent, there's also... And I think there's like a brightness. Yeah, check that out. Brad is like a really unique guy. Um, yeah, I think I usually have it on the brightest, but I can turn it down if I want to, if I've got eye strain. Uh, I also have several of these old Vota, um, leak lights. They're great. They last a long time. Um, but lately I've been using the one Brad made for me. He also made me a wireless one that like sits in the bell, like the battery pack is like wrapped in leather, sits in the bell, has a light on the side to do the bell keys. And then has like a regular light to do the rest, which is kind of amazing. Like I said, Brad is a very unique guy. Very cool. There's my secondary workbench. Um, 
this is kind of like, you know, where stuff goes that I don't have a place for. Usually the horn I'm working on, the parts will be here. Um, there's another, you know, Dazor lamp. I've got like, you know, some drawers for like paperwork and stuff. Um, my dent tools and like a couple cases usually will be out here. Um, some backup tools. My oxyacetylene torch is sitting there right now. Um, and usually like parts of stuff I'm working on will be sitting here, uh, which is the case right now. And then the dent station, which we've been over. Um, and I'll do a part two of tools because I think this is already like 20 minutes long. Um, right after this will be the bench motor and then I'll go over the supply cabinets. Actually, there's like one more set of tools um, and then I guess I can call this one the tools right up is uh, neck fitting tools. I have internal expanders, which you'll see here. I have the um, can opener style expander here. And then I have the shrinker, tenon shrinker made by uh, Bohm Tools. And there's the Alto expander down in there, made by Bohm Tools in Germany. And so that's like the, I guess, vice, right? And then the tenon collets are here and you get like a set and all of those tools I mount in my vise for use um, and that's where I do neck fitting. Here is the other bench motor that I was talking about. This is a uh, Unimat DB200. Um, that I've got set up to run mostly as a bunch, uh, bench motor. The lathe is turned sideways. I've got a DC motor and speed control on it. Um, and But it can also, you know, be turned into a lathe. There's a little milling table, drill press, um, even a tiny table saw. But this is typically to the right of my workstation in the Airstream, but currently it is inside my house right now uh, because I'm doing a lot of work inside during the pandemic since I've got young kids that need watching.